far to find people who, let's say, got a diagnosis of cancer or have, are struggling with some other disease or profound problem of one kind or another, poverty. Uh, we're making progress because of technology. The World Bank reported that poverty in Asia has been cut by half over the last decade because of information technology, but we, we still have a long way to go. And only technology really has the scale to really solve the problems that, that we're facing. And we can talk later, for example, I believe we will solve the energy and global warming problem within about 20 years using nanotechnology. And there's really no other way to do it. Uh, so these technologies enable us to solve problems and overcome suffering. And basically, I, I see that as the grand goal, purpose of, of human civilization, to go beyond our limitations and fundamentally to expand human knowledge. No other species has knowledge. And our knowledge base is, is literally doubling every year with this, you know, 50 different ways to measure it. But no matter how you measure it, we find the doubling time is 11 months, 12 months, 13 months, depending on what you're measuring. And we need our technology just to hold it and keep track of it and search through it. And we're going to need more intelligent search engines to really find it, uh, knowledge based on concepts and so on. So expanding our intelligence, which, which we've already done. I mean, even though most of the computers are not yet inside our bodies and brains, uh, they, they will make their way into our bodies and brains, but most of them are not. Although, if you're a Parkinson's patient, you can have a computer put inside your brain that replaces the biological neurons that are destroyed by that disease. And the latest generation actually allows you to download new software to your computer inside your brain from outside the patient. Uh, so that's for Parkinson's patients. But ultimately, when we can send computers inside our brain through the capillaries non-invasively, which will be feasible in the 2020s, we will be amplifying quite directly our own intelligence. But we routinely do it now with the tools that we, that we have at our fingertips. I mean, just think how quickly you find knowledge about a professor or some product you've, that you hear about with search engines. And think back five years ago, people didn't use search engines. Now, that sounds like ancient history. I mean, imagine life without search engines. But that was five years ago. Three years ago, we didn't have blogs. At least people didn't talk about them. There was no social networks, no podcasts. A lot of things have changed in just a few years' time. So we are expanding at an accelerating pace our own frontiers and our own capability. And fundamentally, we need to get smarter by amplifying our intelligence uh, with this mental amplifier, which is our technology, uh, in order to continue this grand quest to expand human knowledge. And I define knowledge quite broadly to include music, art, as well as science, technology, and so on. Our guest is going to be with us for the next two hours and 45 minutes. If you want to ask him your questions about his writings or his thoughts on the future of technology, here are the numbers. For those of you in the Eastern and Central time zones, it is 202-737-0001. And for those of you who live in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, 202-737-0002. You can also email your thoughts to him. That email, booktv at c-span.org. Essentially, man and machine will become one in the future? Well, let me describe how that will happen. Uh, we're going to send blood cell-sized devices inside our bloodstream, uh, inside our bodies, and also inside our brains through the capillaries uh, to do two things. One, to keep us healthier, to reverse uh, atherosclerosis, destroy pathogens, remove debris, correct DNA errors. If that sounds very futuristic, I point out we are doing at least a first generation of that already in animals. One scientist cured type 1 diabetes with a blood cell size device that lets insulin out in a controlled fashion. Scientists at MIT have a blood cell size device that actually destroys cancer cells by detecting the antigens on their surface, burrowing inside, releasing toxins, and destroying the cell. I mean, this is today. And take this billion-fold magnification or uh, expansion that I talked about in a quarter century of the capabilities of information technology, computers, and communication, and apply that to what we can already do. And in 25 years, we'll have these nanobots, blood cell size devices, will be very sophisticated. They'll be, a they'll be capable of keeping us healthy from inside and also interacting directly with our biological neurons. We've already shown that that's feasible. And expanding human intelligence. How small are nanobots? Well, blood cell size. Nano refers to a billionth of a meter. Uh, but that means the key features are measured in some modest number of nanometers. Uh, a nanometer is the, the width of five carbon atoms. 
But it doesn't mean that the nanobot is one nano, uh, that the nanobot is one nanometer. It means that the features are measured in a modest number, 5, 10, 20 nanometers. The whole device is actually microns, millionths of a meter, which is the size of a blood cell. And a blood cell is basically a, a nano robot, and it can be quite sophisticated. A white blood cell is actually intelligent, can detect friend from foe and devise strategies to destroy it. But there's one actually deficient, there's a couple of deficiencies, but there's one significant deficiency of our white blood cells. I've actually watched my own white blood cells in a microscope. They're very slow. Biology is actually quite sluggish. It took, it took my white blood cell an hour and a half to destroy this bacteria on a slide. And I think it was operating at full speed. Uh, ultimately, these nanorobots will be able to do that in seconds. They won't be subject to autoimmune disorders. They can download software from the internet to combat specific pathogens. If that sounds very futuristic, I'd point out there's lots of devices we're putting inside the body and brain now, today, that download software from outside the body, like, like this implant for Parkinson's patients. Uh, so as these devices get smaller, according to my models, we're shrinking technology at an exponential rate, a rate of 100 per 3D volume per decade. So in 25 years, these devices will be 100,000 times smaller in terms of key features, and they'll be a billion times more capable, and they're already pretty impressive. If that plays out, where does human end and machine begin, and how, I guess, is there a moral question when you combine those two? Not in my mind. I mean, we're the species that goes beyond our limitations. And uh, so expanding our horizons with our tools is really what human civilization is all about. I mean, we have a cerebral co cortex that can do abstract reasoning, so we can look at that stone and say, hey, you know, I could combine that stone with that stick and create some, a tool that extends my leverage. We have an opposable appendage that actually works. Other uh, chimpanzees' hands look similar, but it's actually not very well designed. Does, they don't have a power grip. They don't have fine motor coordination. They just aren't quite at that level to create technology. And they use tools, but the tools never evolve. So we've been able to actually create tools and technology, and then we always use the latest technology to create the next. That's why the process accelerates. And that has been its own evolutionary process. And that, that has enabled us to expand our horizons. Now, if you ask a Parkinson's patient whether that neural implant is part of him or her, you know, maybe different people would answer differently, but it's very much actually part of their, uh, their sense of identity. Because they used to be able to do things, then they had the disease, and they found they developed certain disabilities, and then this implant, when it's successful, which it often is, uh, allows them again to, to do what they used to do. They can, they're delighted to consider that part of themselves. If machines, as you say, will become more human in their reasoning, is it going to change our relationship that we have to computers and, and machines right now? Uh, typically, they're typically impersonal things that sit in our desk. Is that going to change? Absolutely. I mean, machines, and that's a grand trend that's underway. I mean, machines used to be very remote. I mean, you couldn't deal with them at all unless you were a technician. And you know, when I went to MIT in 1965, there was one big computer in an air-conditioned room, and you couldn't get close to it. And you had to be pretty much of an expert to have any interaction with it. And then we had the personal computing revolution. And now these devices are fairly friendly. They're in our pockets. We carry them under our arms. They're really extensions of ourselves. Uh, search engines really en enable us to find information quite easily. The next revolution is going to be a certain amount of natural language understanding. These machines will be able to deal with normal conversation, not at human levels, but enough to actually find information and do routine transactions. So they're getting friendlier and friendlier. So they're moving more towards us rather than us having to move towards a classical concept of what a machine is, which is kind of a 19th century concept of something that's not very warm and fuzzy. But machines are getting more complex. I mean, we have trillions of moving parts in a human being. And a 19th century machine had maybe hundreds or thousands of parts. Now they have billions of parts, still not at human levels. But they're moving in that direction because of this exponential expansion. And it's worth making another point, which is people say, you can't predict the future. And, that, and that's kind of the common wisdom. And it, it is, in fact, not possible to predict specific projects, specific people. But the overall impact of information technology turns out to be very predictable. Uh, for example, the price performance of computing. Let's say the cost 
of a MIPS of computing. MIPS is million instructions per second. I have a graph in the book that goes back to 1890, a very smooth exponential progression. Uh, despite wars and peace and war and depressions and boom times and the Cold War and through all those vagaries of human history, you have very smooth, very predictable exponential progressions. And you have there the age of intelligent machines, which was my first book I wrote 20 years ago, that has uh, hundreds of predictions about the 1990s and early 2000 years based on these models, based on this very predictable exponential progression of information technology. And they, they've tracked quite accurately. And many of those predictions were, were quite controversial at the time. And you might wonder, well, how could this be? I mean, how can we make reliable predictions about the overall impact of information technology when each specific project, each company, each person is unpredictable? And we see other examples in science of that. I mean, in thermodynamics, you have a gas made up of a lot of unpredictable particles. Each particle is, in fact, modeled by a random walk. You can't predict where one molecule will be 10 seconds from now. But the overall gas is very predictable, according to the laws of thermodynamics to a very high degree of precision. So if you have a large, dynamic, chaotic system with, where each element is unpredictable, the overall system can have some very predictable properties. And that's really the, b and technology evolution is just such a dynamic system where we can make these reliable predictions despite the fact that every specific project and every specific uh, individual is unpredictable. And that's really the basis of, of the predictions I've made. And I've been using these models for, for three decades. As you look at the future, what are important dates then for us to consider about your thoughts on, on the future of technology? Well, by 2020, $1,000 of computation will equal the uh, 10 to the 16th, 10 million billion calculations per second that I estimate is required to simulate the whole human brain. But that actually won't by itself achieve human levels of intelligence. We'll need the software of human intelligence. And we're going to get that in a number of ways, but uh, one of the important ways is actually by reverse engineering the human brain, and that'll take a bit longer. So I've been very consistent in saying 2029, we'll have a computer that can pass the Turing test. This was a test devised by Alan Turing to ascertain whether a computer was actually achieving human levels of intelligence. And in the Turing test, you have a human judge interviews a computer and a human uh, using basically instant messaging, so the judge can't see the human and, and the computer, and just chats with them. Uh, you know, what movie did you see? What do you think of the principal character? And, and if after a few hours of this dialogue, the, the human judge can't tell the difference between the, the two, you know, can't tell which one is the computer and which one is the human, we say the computer has passed the Turing test. And I believe that will happen in 2029, and it's actually a good test. There's no simple trick with language or simple you know, computational trick you could deploy to enable a computer to pass that test without actually giving it the equivalent of human intelligence. San Diego, California. Good morning. Uh, thank you, C-SPAN. This is uh, Albert Torres, and I want to know two questions, basically. Uh, the one's going to be answered really quick. You could just give me like an arbitrary percentage. The second one you can just expand on. Um, basically, I want to know how much do you think of the technology that's currently being created is used for military use? And secondly, are you aware of any connections between some of the research that's been going on between quantum mechanics and spirituality about like movies like What the Bleep? Basically, things uh, that are trying to prove the existence of God. Okay, well, uh, let's see if we can make some estimates. I mean, here in the United States, our military budget order of magnitude is maybe half a trillion, and our gross national product order of magnitude is about 10 trillion, but let's say three or four trillion of that is technology related. So maybe one sixth of our uh, technology efforts go into military applications. In this country, and that's probably a high percentage compared to other countries because we have such a large military establishment, so that's an off-the-cuff uh, estimate. Uh, you bring up actually a pretty rich issue. Uh, quantum mechanics, at least some interpretations of quantum mechanics bear some relationship uh, to Eastern or Buddhist 
thoughts where the principal reality is actually human awareness, 